You're listening to this week's You Ask, We Answer session, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. Welcome back. We're at another You Ask, We Answer. Pastor Thompson and I are sitting here at the table. We got some good questions today. Um, The first question we have, what I like about this question is, it's highly relevant because it takes part of our faith, it takes our Christian faith, and then looks at it from a real-world scenario of a struggle that's super real for some people um, in their life. So we'll jump right into this. This first question, it hits on a heavy topic, and it's a topic that, like I said, there's probably a lot of people who struggle with this either personally or they struggle with it with family members. This, this one in particular is dealing with a family member and how to care for them. And, and so it's, it's talking about the subject of addiction. And um, when you have someone in your family that you love and you're caring for them and they're suffering with addiction, it's affecting the whole family. Um, the person is loved by their spouse, by their family. They've done things, you know, they've done the logical things like interventions. And they said in this question, for example, said that it's been disastrous. They said they prayed for this family member um, citing how scripture tells us in the New Testament to actually pray for people. Um, and they've noted how there's a failure to, for this person that's struggling with this sin, to acknowledge their sin, to acknowledge that perhaps it's a disease, um, kind of just turning turning a blind eye to it, it seems like what the person is doing. So the root of the question from this listener is, is it ever okay to give up on the person that's suffering with addiction? So is the family, and to go a little further, is the family of the addicted person committing a terrible sin or a terrible wrong or taking taking a horrible step if they give up in the sense of, I'm going to stop trying to fight you to change you from this addiction? So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go ahead and stop talking and, and get Pastor Thompson's thoughts here because it seems like they're layers and layers of layers of something like this. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, first, just let me acknowledge what you did when and the questioner said this addiction affects the whole family. Yes, it does. And, and that's important to realize. It's not as easy as just saying, all right, we're going to ignore this or because it, it affects folks. And this, it's, you feel the pain in the question. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. Everyone is suffering. They want to help. Their attempts to help have failed up to this point. And honestly, if you just read, is it ever okay to give up on a person? Well, the answer is, well, no, God doesn't give up and we don't give up. But as you read how they state it the second time, to give up and stop trying and fighting to change the person. To that, I would say yes. In fact, it might be the healthiest and most helpful thing you can do is to give up trying to change the person. And it's hard because you see a person who is uh, involved in addictive behavior that is harming them, and, and to step away from that feels like you're giving up on the person completely. Right. But that might be the very first step to actually helping the person. Yeah, and I have to think that's a great point. Um, and I agree with you. Like, do I ever fully give up on the person? Like we say no, like, cause Christ never did it. I mean, look in the old Testament, he's constantly going back to people. God's still today, constantly going back to us as his people in the old Testament. God was constantly going back to his people. But I, I think you have a very good point there where the, the actual act of fighting that particular addiction, would you say that if you fight too much, it destroys the relationship? Yes. And this is where it gets so messy mm-hmm. and how it affects the whole family. Not only does it destroy the relationship, it can destroy you. Yeah. I mean, this is the trying to save the drowning person who grabbing on to you for life pulls you under. Yeah. And that that's that's so I'm thinking of different examples. So there's there's a, a mild example here. I don't know the scenario that this listener is. I'm 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 just guessing, but like a mild scenario would be like I have a family member who loves to eat, they're obese. They're addicted to food. I keep trying to help them exercise, get healthy, and, and I'm seeing that it's destroying the relationship that I have with that person. 
So I'm going to stop. And that one I think is a little bit easier to say, okay, I'm going to stop fighting this. I'm going to live with you civilly for the number of years we have left and make those peaceful years. They'd be likely shorter than the timeline. So there, there's that. But then if you get something that's like much more of a grave issue and you said, um, like I'm watching my, my, my family member addicted to methamphetamines or something, let's go something really deep. And I'm, I mean, it's destroying their lives on a day-to-day real-time basis. I think that is a lot harder to say. Like it's, how do you still have a relationship with the person when you see them literally, um, destroying themselves with chemicals and you're like, what do I do? Right. Right. And what's, I mean, I, I look at you like, what do I do? Like there's an answer, but there's not a, there's not a clear answer on that. Yeah. I, I, and I'll keep coming back to this. You're in a hard situation. Yeah. You are in an extremely hard situation. And so the fact that you're struggling with this, yes, you're going to struggle with it. It is hard. There's no clear answer. There's no easy fix. Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the family member who's overeating doesn't affect you as much, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because you don't have to bail them out of jail right. when they get three servings and they should have had one. Right. Right. It's much more mild. Yeah. yeah. Someone who has a, a significant drug addiction can quickly become a danger to you, to family members. And, and, and it's more obvious you have to maybe, um, well, a word we haven't mentioned yet that I think is helpful is, is set up a boundary. That, that kind of defines, I'm responsible for me, and I'm responsible to care for you and to love you in the ways that I can. Can, yeah. But that's not a, we get in trouble when we, we take the place of God, mm. meaning only God can change a life. God uses people. He works through people. He may work through your efforts. But Mark, I'll be honest, like when I see a problem, my first impulse is, oh, I can fix that. Right, same. And I've been slow to learn that sometimes the Lord gives me insight so that I can pray. Yeah. Now, again, addiction is much more complicated than, than just solving a problem or praying. There, there's a lot more to it. But, but I do think it begins with, again, going back to my giving up on this person by not trying to fix them. I would say, no, you're, you're accepting some, some limitations. You're accepting your own limits. Mm-hmm. I'm not God. I can't change them. I can't break that addiction for them. Right. I can't make choices for them. We can do it in short term, right? If your kid's younger, you can lock them up in rehab, but often that doesn't work right. when they're going against their will. Right. Right. And that's, like you said, that's hard for us to, I mean, it, it would be as much as it shouldn't be. It's easy for me to drive by some person I don't know that's addicted to something and just carry on. But when it's a family member that I love, that I want to live as many years as possible with them and I, and I care about them, then it, it's a daily painful thing. Um, and so I, I think you raised a very, very good point there that there are things outside of our scope. There are things outside of our scope as human beings. This is change that God needs to create because it's bigger than me. Um, and so that, I think that's a really good point for us to remember as we go through these things, we're battling these things. Is this something that I can even should even put on my plate? And that's a, that's a hard thing to say. It's really hard to go. No, it's not. Because then you're kind of letting some control and you're also kind of turning and saying, um, put it in God's hands, which yeah, put it in God's hands. That's what you need to do. Sounds great. Terribly, terribly difficult, even terrifying sometimes. Sure, because things don't change immediately. God, I mean, again, they said we prayed. Right. They hadn't fixed it yet. Right. Putting it in God's hands means I keep praying, keep waiting, I keep hoping. I keep the door open in the sense of I'm open to this person changing. But again, I would say you accept your own limitations. I mean, strong mm-hmm. boundaries begins with who is God and who is not. God is God. I am not. Right. But it also between the two of us, right? I am me. God's made me responsible for me and my choices, and he's made you responsible for your choices. Mm-hmm. And if I start taking responsibility for your choices, that harms you and it harms me. Right. It's not the way God 
great right. things. And it's, it's awful when you can see how much it messes with the relationship. And you think, and you go, okay, I've got, I've got a decade more with this person. I'm just ballparking. Do I need to spend that 10 years like railing on them, trying to get them to change and ruin that relationship for 10 years? Or do I need to try to live, let them be responsible, you said responsible for their choices and try to live as civilly as possible, knowing that I'm not going to change them? I'll try to be a good influence on them, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to solve the problem. And I think there's some freedom in that. Because when you live under the other umbrella of, I have to change this person, and you're, you're almost literally beating your head against the wall trying to get that change going, you realize how miserable every encounter is with the person. And that's easy to say in my shoes sitting here, but it's when you actually see it and feel it, it's, it's where you got to make that choice. What, what do I do here? I learned something from the previous pastor here, um, Pastor Tutwiler, if you're out there. Um, I won't quote him exactly because I can't remember, but, but he just said, sometimes we get in the way of the pain God wants a person to experience. Mm. You know, it's the old, in recovery world, they talk about hitting rock bottom. Sometimes we get in the way trying to be helpful, mm. trying to help the person. We keep them from rock bottom. And, and look, again, we come back to, this is so hard. I am so grateful I've never had to kick a kid out of my house. Yeah. Because he was endangering his mother or because I thought I'm enabling him to continue his destructive behaviors and I need to force him to take responsibility for him. I, I can't imagine the difficulty yeah. of a parent who goes through that. But parents do go through that, and, and we call it tough love. But it's not really tough love. It's really just love. Yeah. And it's so counterculture. We live in a day in which love means we just embrace and accept anything that someone thinks is right for them but biblically, love is, no, I am working for your good. And working for your good sometimes means allowing you to suffer the consequences of your choices in hope that the consequences you suffer will lead you to turn. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot because that's like God's still working in your life, whether you acknowledge him or not, but God's still working in your life. And this may be just a moment where you have to get hit by that two by four right in the face. And as much as you said, like a parent or a spouse or a brother or whatever, you hate for it to come to that. Like I always think I hate um, for someone to have to really come and see the Lord through such hardship. Maybe that's what's neat. And again, easy to say us sitting right here, not having walked that. Um, And when I think about this question, my mind naturally goes to, you know, we think about the Lord, and I think, um, and I don't know, I don't know this scenario any, any, any more than what was just shared, but thinking about what's the pre, what is the role of the Christian faith or God at all in the life of this person? Because my nature n- naturally goes to, that's a good start. Like, if I think, why don't I, why am I not addicted to drugs? Well, it's because the Lord tells me I shouldn't be doing that. So that's my foundation. And so if the, this person has even a little glimmer of that foundation, in practically speaking, feels like that might be a place to maybe start. Maybe there's a tiny little ember kind of glowing. Blow on that and get that going. Um, but again, easier said than done. Yeah. And, and let me say a couple of things related to that. Um, one, if, if you're dealing with a family member who's addicted... I'm going to contradict myself here. Don't try to make sense of it. Mm. They are making decisions that you are not going to make sense of. Right. Like you said, when you're not addicted, it's like, well, that's bad for me. I know I shouldn't do that. Now, I might still be tempted, but I'm fighting against it. But that's no longer where the addicted person is. And, and yeah. I found it interesting in their question here. Um, there is a failure to acknowledge the presence of sin in their disease. Mm. So that's an, I mean... And, and that's been an argument that's gone on for decades. Is this addiction, is it sin or is it a disease? And I would say it's both. Yeah. Every addiction starts with sin, right? Right. right. I, I make a sinful choice, but then I make it again and again and again. But at some point, I would say it does transition into a disease also. So I'm not saying it's not sin. 
I'm just saying also in the sense of if we make that same sinful choice so over and over and over, at some point we lose the ability to not make that choice. Right. And I say that to say if a person is addicted, it isn't going to do a whole lot good to say you just need to repent. And I think sometimes, yeah. again, out of, of longing for them to experience true life, we, we just we beg them, please repent, please get help. But for them, that that's they they pass that point right way back there so is it hopeless no it's not hopeless um, um you know aa is a great example mm-hmm. if you go to an aa meeting they'll tell you oh yeah i can't choose not to drink well, when's your last drink oh i've been i've been sober 10 years how'd you do that well i can make other choices mm. i can choose to go to aa yeah i can choose to get a sponsor I can choose to keep going to AA even if I've, after I've been sober 10 years. So those are all things I can still choose to do. But an alcoholic admits I've lost the ability to say no to alcohol. And so for the addicted person, it's getting them into a key component uh, we're seeing is community. Again, that's hard. They, right. they, they don't want that necessarily. But if you can get them into community, they begin to experience some grace and acceptance especially among other recovering addicts. Again, there are ways forward, but again, the person asking this question, I, th- I suspect they've tried all that. Yeah. So really yeah. getting to the heart of their question is realizing, I can't make sense of this. I, I, don't, I need to maintain my boundaries so I remain healthy. I remain right. engaged with the Lord. I continue to pray. I continue to hope for them, but I also entrust them to the Lord. That can be hard. Yeah, and, and I, as you were saying, I completely agree with you, what you were saying. Like, a lot of times with addictions, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, so I'm, I'm guessing here, but there's chemical things going on in the body that are not just turn them off. There's chemical stuff going on there. There, there could even be mental things, mental illnesses that you didn't even know about and came about through this. So there's a lot of factors playing in there that us sitting here at this table can be just like, eh, let's turn it off, but it doesn't work like that. Um, and, and so that's, that's terribly hard. And, and what also came to mind is when you do finally step away and I've never been like this, but I'm assuming I have to wonder, does that feel like a death, like a death of the person? Like, okay, you're going to, you're going to smoke or snort yourself to death. I mean, that, that's not, there's nothing easy about that. Right. There's nothing casual and there's nothing. Oh, just, just sign off. You may say, yeah, I'll just sign off. But then when your things have settled down, you're, it's heartbreaking. Absolutely. It's, it's difficult. So, But you bring up, I think, something that for this family member they need to do is, is to mourn, to grieve. Yeah. Obviously, their, their family member is not where they want them to be. They're not in the kind of relationship they had, had dreamed of having with this person. So, yeah, you mourn that. You mm-hmm. grieve that. It's part of your prayers. And, and you mourn that we live in a broken world. Yeah. You know? And... and Come Lord Jesus. Yeah. And I would, I would, and, and on that note in that morning or in the, in the whole process of this, it helps to, and I'm, I'm saying just problems in general, it helps to talk to people, talk to people in the faith. What comes to mind are like Stephen ministers or, or a pastor or a fellow disciple in the faith and, and just talk to them and just have that person sit there and just listen to you. And then you get it all out. And then maybe you meet on a regular basis to where you can process this stuff and say, Today was really hard. I saw this person. Man, they are strung out. They look ridiculous. I don't know how to make sense of this. And then it just, it helps you kind of grieve through the process so that you're not just living in your head and you're not living with just this guilt of, man, I'm such a bad person. I just signed off because it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Good word. But I like how I like the person that asked this, I would say, continue to stay in prayer. The Lord absolutely does stuff that, it may take years and it may defy full logic of every puzzle piece you've put together here and God can still work in the person's life. And, and I was talking to Robin actually about this question beforehand. We were, we were actually testing the audio equipment because it was malfunctioning. And um, I read that question to her and she, I said, do you, ever, do you ever give up on a person? And she goes, no. I mean, she was like abrupt, no. I was like, well, what about Sarah? She goes, no. You just may care for them in different ways than you did at the start. Um, and I thought that was a, it kind of opened my eyes to, you may pray differently this time. 
You may have been praying for full healing addiction. Now you may, may be praying for something different, but you're still dialoguing with the Lord about it. So good thought. Um, kudos to the wifey there on that one. All right, let's jump to our next question here. Uh, so this question is a little bit more uh, centered where we can actually go to the Bible and pull an answer on this one. This is saying, why isn't the Passover a bigger part of Christian traditions? And so before we get into like the why of it, I want to give a little grounding because not everyone knows, and please fill in where I have gaps here, but not everyone knows the Passover. So the Passover comes from the book of Exodus. And the Exodus is um, the book where, you know, where, where the Israelites are in Egypt. Um, they're under slavery of the Egyptians, the Pharaoh. God starts doing these plagues, warning Pharaoh to let his people go. And they get all the way to the last one, right? It's the 10th. It's the 10th one where it's, it's the, it's the, we're going to kill your firstborns. Yes. Firstborn, firstborn yes. animal, livestock, firstborn children. Yeah. yeah. So this is bringing some serious consequences to the Egyptians. So God, uh, through Moses speaks to the people and says that they, that the households or groups of households, depending on their wealth and status, that if they, they were to take a lamb and it was to be a, a lamb without blemish. So we see this little connection to Christ and they were to sacrifice it, and then they were to take the blood, and they were to put it on, on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And then they ate parts of the lamb. And, um, so it was, it was very much Old Testament sacrifice, right? Um, and they put the, that, that uh, blood on the, outside their homes, and then the Lord came through the land, the Egyptian land, and he killed the firstborn of any home that didn't have the red. So ten, so. It's the name. The Lord passed over, showed mercy to these Israelites, and didn't take their firstborn, whereas the Egyptians, they did. So fill in the gaps. Where did I miss anything there? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. And, and I would just add, and the Jews have celebrated the Passover, right? That's a yearly celebration for them. Mm-hmm. And it is both a looking back to what God did, but if you've ever, you ever done a Seder meal no. with anyone? I've, I've, I've done one kind of by this uh, Jew who had become a Christian, he was also raising money, so it took like four hours. It was a little bit long. Um, <laughs> Kept passing the plate? Yeah, yeah it kind of was like that. It kind of was like that. Um, but the language of the Passover is as if you don't speak of our ancestors experienced this. You speak like we, we the people, we, mm. because there's, so it's both remembering God's great act of salvation and sparing his people from death through the blood of the lamb. But then it's also this remembering we are those people. We, mm. there's, there's this huge family connection as children of Abraham that, that as it happened to our ancestors, it is true of us as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a very significant yearly celebration filled with all sorts of symbolism. You've mentioned several. Um, so I would just say it, it is such a central practice for those um, who practice the Jewish faith, that it's a yearly thing that both recognizes the historical event, but also brings it into the significance of how it what it signifies for us today, that Mm -hmm. God is setting his people free. I like how you said there that this is, they made it a we thing. They made it personal, which that's, that's interesting because we often think of the old Testament as they, and this was a we, and this is our God. And this is what our God did for us. Um, So you said this was a Christian circle that was doing a Seder meal. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now the guy leading it was Jewish who had come to the Messiah. Okay, so he had all the roots of everything. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so it was, it was very informative. I mean, I learned a ton. It was pretty amazing. And he was able to bring out, again, as a Christian, as so much of the Old Testament, yeah. you now go back as a Christian, and you're like, whoa, all the moments in there that point to Christ. Yeah. So that's what's, it, it's worth doing. I don't, I don't want to discourage people. A, a Seder meal is worth doing, especially with someone with a Jewish background that truly understands all the elements. Yeah. yeah. That you bring a great point there. I love how when you start looking at the old Testament, not as just the old Testament, old covenant, but you start looking at it as every single little gem or nugget in the old Testament. That's pointing to the coming Messiah. It opens up, at least for me, I used to think the old Testament was just a boring, confusing book. And then, but when you look at it and go like land without blemish, Oh, that sounds familiar. That's pointing to eventual Christ. And so all these little things point to, point to Jesus coming and it connects these books so well when you look at it like that versus just looking at it as a separate. So 
It gives a little background on the Passover. Um, if you're curious of, of wanting to actually read that text, Exodus 12, chapter 12, is a good chapter to read. I mean, that's basically where it, where it sources itself, and then it obviously continues. Um, but, but let's get to the heart of the question. So why don't we... So the, the question is, why isn't the Passover a bigger part? But why don't we celebrate the Passover as Christians? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, one answer, not the only answer. One answer is we do. We just call it the Lord's Supper. That's not, <laughs> that's not entirely well, yeah. accurate. Yeah. But it goes back to the historical reference is what we're about to celebrate um, is Monday, Thursday next week yeah. um, of, of what we call the Last Supper. Mm-hmm. You know why we call it the last? No. Well, I mean, other than Christ, basically, it's Jesus' last, last meal, yeah, yeah. right? Um, we call it the Lord's Supper because it was, but that was a Passover meal. Yes, that was a Passover meal. So he was selling, <laughs> celebrating the yearly celebration of the Passover with his disciples, as a good Jewish as a good person Jewish, would have yes, been done yes. doing. Yes, except he broke from the script. Right? So in the Passover meal, there's a script, and, and the head of the household and, and different family members, down to the youngest kids, have a role. They have parts that they read. But Jesus broke from the script. So they're passing around the bread, and he's saying, This is my body. So now, in that context, so I'm thinking about you said he broke from the script, and he broke from it by saying, This is my body, which was like, What? But the meal that they actually had there on the table, talk, talking practically the items they were eating, they obviously, did they actually sacrifice something? Do yeah, we have any, but yeah that's, that's the assumption. Remember, he sent, I can't remember, I think one of the Gospels designates it actually was Peter and John. I'm oh, all fuzzy that's on that. right. But to go and prepare, to make oh, preparation. Okay. So part of that was securing the room. Yeah, yeah. But part yeah. of that would have been securing all the elements, including a Passover lamb that had been sacrificed. Okay, so then the lamb, let's say it was Jesus this meal, the lamb was... Sacrifice according to what God said and doing with something with the blood, but then they prepared the meat in a manner at which they would eat it. I, yeah, that's my understanding. Ah, yeah. See, I had never put that together. I always thought, oh, they had like some cold cuts and some bread and right. some olives or right. something. No, they had, I think, ah. and again, I'm a little fuzzy on some of this, but I think four passings of the cup and again, different meaning, significance. Again, he broke from the script. This is my blood. Right? Take and drink. Got to wonder what their faces. Yeah, yeah. If they kind of looked around and were like, "Hey, did you just hear him? He right. just he. What is he doing?" And I suspect a lot of it was like we talked about um, in the Sunday readings podcast mm-hmm. uh, about Palm Sunday, where it tells us directly the disciples did not understand yeah. the significance until yeah. afterwards. I suspect that was true of some of this as well. God, that what? Imagine being in the disciples' shoes and sitting there, knowing you've probably done this meal probably in their 20s or 30s, 15 something times. And then this, Jesus starts saying, this is my body and starts saying, this is the new covenant. And this is like, the whole thing is getting turned on its head. Right, right. Yeah, you mentioned new covenant. Wait, new? Right, why, why, why? yeah. Wait, new? Now, they had the Old Testament promises that God was going to make a new covenant. Right. At the time when he set his people free from their sin and forgave their sin. Right? The Jews were always looking forward to that time. Mm-hmm. And now Jesus is saying... Time is now. Time is yeah. now. Time is now. Yeah, so it's Jesus' last supper, but in his last supper, he's taking this Passover meal, um, and, and he's, he's giving it a new meaning. Right? It right. is now to be interpreted as his body and blood, which is the, the blood that right. saves us from death. But what is interesting, and, and, and correct me on this if I'm off, but... In the Old Testament way, they had to sacrifice a living creature, the land without blemish, every time at Passover. So a new sacrifice, new sacrifice, new sacrifice. Whereas with the other way Christ flips a script is it's a once for all sacrifice. Right. And then it's more of a, now you receive the gift of this sacrifice because I already did it. So you don't have to keep crucifying me every year at whatever the month was. Um, it's a one-time thing, and now it's just gifts to you. Yes. The book of Hebrews tells us that, right? Right. Describes the priest year after year after year offering the same sacrifice. Jesus, our great high priest, one sacrifice for all, for all time. So we could say one of the reasons 
So I like how you said we do kind of celebrate the Passover every Sunday because um, it's the Lord's Supper. But it's not in the same connection as the Passover in the sense of we're sacrificing and offering a sacrifice to God. Like God, God came down in Christ, did the sacrifice for himself, and then offers us his grace. Yes. Which is a very different. So perhaps answering this question is we don't do the we don't celebrate the Passover anymore because Jesus. Yes. Sunday school answer. Yes. I mean, yes. Which is so much is true of the Old Testament that what we see is kind of its earliest forms are fulfilled in Christ. Right. And so we don't practice a lot of those Jewish Old Testament practices because we say they were fulfilled in Christ. Now Christ right. has inaugurated a new day. Yeah. But it's interesting, and I think it's, it's educational and beneficial to participate in a Seder meal because you do see the historical roots of we as God's people all the way back to the book of Exodus. Yes, yes. Um, so Romans, oh, it's 9, 10, or 11. Um, we are grafted in yeah, yeah. to Israel's tree, right? We're, we're the wild branches that are over here at our pagan temples doing our own worship thing that God has grafted us in. So just like the Jews celebrating the Passover, speaking of we, I mean, we, we can too, right? right? Yeah, Those yeah. are our people now. We have been adopted into that lineage of God's chosen people, Israel. We are now Israel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but to... Uh, I think you said it best. Why don't we celebrate the Passover in that way as a kind right. of a, almost a Easter level celebration right. year after year, because we celebrate weekly that Christ has fulfilled the Passover. The yeah. Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. Yeah. But if you get a chance to do a Seder meal, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Get at it. It is worth doing. Again, you, you will have the eye opening experience of just being mouth open. Um, you know, how do people not see how this points to Christ? There's yeah. so much throughout the whole thing that is so Christian um, that it, it, it's, it's actually very encouraging. So I yeah. agree wholeheartedly it's worth doing. I think it'd be fascinating to do it in the scenario you were saying where you have someone who was Jewish, knows it in depth, and can, and can lead you through it in depth. Um, very cool. And just make sure you can pay your babysitter three or four hours in case it runs on that long. I don't think they have to be that long. But. So did you literally eat? For four hours? We did. We did. Now, we didn't eat a full meal. You got a sampling. Okay. I mean, you, you kind of sampled. And brother, the bitter herbs. What is it? What exactly is a bitter herb? Oh, I've will, read that. Uh, it'll make your eyes water. Is it? Is it? Uh, it's obviously something edible, but you just, is it in like an olive oil or is it just a, like eating a piece of, of lettuce? Yeah. I, I don't recall, but it, it seems to be more just like parsley, just eating a little piece of kind of leafy thing. But again, the meaning was to remember our suffering in Egypt, yeah. you know, with our bitter days that the Lord has set us free from. For some reason, when I read, I see that word bitter herbs, we used to have a, I think it was a thyme plant, T H Y M E, is that how it's spelled? In our backyard in our old house. And I just, that comes to mind, like just eating that, because it always was so fragrant. Um, so, if y'all know anything about eating bitter herbs, stop and holler at us, because I don't. But great discussion. I got to tell you, if, I learned so much sitting across from this guy. So if you have a chance to sit across from Pastor Thompson in any setting, do it. Uh, go to his classes, whatever. What you just shared, just this, um, this 30 minutes. A lot of interesting insights, a lot of good stuff. Great discussion, relevant stuff for our world. So if you have questions um, for this podcast, again, send them in. We're keeping this going. We're getting a, we're getting a long list, which is so great and encouraging. Um, we're even getting people outside of our OSL church that are sending in questions. So um, send them in. And then this Sunday, Palm Sunday, April 10th, after late service, we're doing, is it after late service? No, I'm confused. Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, this, so next Thursday, this coming Thursday, I'm so confused, not this Thursday, next Thursday, Holy Week, we're doing kind of a Seder meal type. Um, do you know if there's going to be any teaching with it? I, I don't know. I believe there is. I believe... Okay. And I should correct, if you watch our other podcast, Pastor Ed, you said I was a part of planning this. This is actually Mark's wife, Robin, who did the whole thing. <laughs> I don't know anything about it either. <laughs> I think she mentioned the idea to me, and I said, that sounds good. That was the extent of my planning. But I do recall, I think she has these plates okay. that, that kind of show the different foods. And so I didn't think there will be some teaching element. Okay. Um, she hadn't asked me, and I haven't raised my hand, because I don't, I don't belong in that place of teaching this stuff. So 
but come out. Um, we're going to be doing that on Monday, Thursday. It's before services at seven. Um, the meals at what, like five, five thirty? Yeah, five thirty. Um, I believe. So come out. It'll be neat. If nothing else, it's a great fellowship opportunity and an opportunity to taste some foods that, like, I think someone's bringing something bitter herb. I'm, I'm sure because we should say before we overwhelm Robin and freak her out. Um, <laughs> Over promise. It, it, it is a, um, a Passover potluck. So you yeah. are asked to bring something. And now most of us don't have many Passover recipes, but Robin, bring as, being as brilliant as she is, will provide you a recipe yeah. that you can bring something to share with others. Yeah. So, Yeah, I keep going back. I mentioned on our other podcast, apricot brisket is the one that I saw on the sheet and I thought, Man, I never would put brisket and apricot together, but let's give it a run. So y'all come out, hang out with us um, next Holy Week. I got to tell you, man, my, my days are so blurred. This is ridiculous. So next week is Holy Week. Come out on Monday, Thursday. We'll do, we'll do a Seder meal and we'll, we'll taste some neat foods and hopefully get a little education on that. See, Mark, this is your first time through as a pastor. You're like the college <sighs> basketball player that's now in the NBA and like you're not playing once a week, you're playing every two days, and you're traveling. And I want to be back. You used to where, it. You're yeah. Used to it. This I, I gotta say, first time in Holy Week or first time Lent, man, it's a it's a it's a sprint. It's a sprint marathon. It's fast. So, but it's great, great time of year. So, hopefully, y'all enjoyed this conversation. Send some questions in, and we'll keep this. You ask, we answer podcast going. Y'all have a great week. <laughs>